Again, John chapter 12, verses 27 through 36 is our passage for today. Now, whenever you walk into a store, you're often reminded of what holiday is coming up. Right? When we, we start seeing Christmas decorations, what is it now, end of October? Uh, definitely in November. Um, and then after Christmas happens, what de- decorations are next? If I recall, I think it's Valentine's Day right after that. And then you have St. Patrick's Day, and the list goes on, on and on and on. So if you're ever wondering, you know, what holiday is coming up, just walk into a store, look around, and you'll see the decorations on the shelf, and you'll know exactly what holiday is coming up. As we look at this passage today, we're reminded of a day that 2,000 years ago was coming up. Now, more specifically, Jesus is reminded of a day that for him was coming up, the day of his death and the day, as John emphasizes, the day of his glorification. But, of course, he didn't just walk into a store in Jerusalem to find this out. He realized it when a group of non-Jews, a group of, of Greeks, came to his disciples and said, we want to see Jesus. So the disciples went to tell Jesus, and at that moment, it's as if Jesus' focus changed. He knew that the time had come. Passover was almost, there, almost here. It was time for him to accomplish the mission the Father had given him. Now, it's very common, unfortunately, for believers to ignore the gospel in their day-to-day lives, right? Especially when we are surrounded by people who need it. And when we look at this, this calendar notification of Jesus, that the gospel was going to be accomplished by his death, that prompted him to proclaim the gospel to those around him. That's what we're going to see in this passage today. And not just to proclaim the gospel to those around him, but to be laser-focused on the mission that the Father had given him. So how does Jesus continue talking about his upcoming death after he found out about the group of Greeks wanting to see him? How does this continue? That's what we're going to see here in these next few verses. So first of all, in verses 27 through 30, what we're going to see is that because the Father glorified the Son in his death, and of course at this point in the story will glorify the Son in his death, we must believe in him. We must believe in Jesus because of that special relationship between the Father and the Son where the Father accepted and was at this point in the story was ready to accept, was going to accept the Son's sacrifice. Everyone wants to get to the Father, right? How do you get to the Father? It is through the Son. You see, the Father is going to glorify the Son. We know the Son is the way. That's why we must believe in Him. So if you would, look with me at verse 27. And here again, we have Jesus being so transparent. We can often think of Jesus as being, you know, just a, 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 a huge, you know, slab of granite. You know, just the strongest being unimmovable, completely Uh, set on his mission and nothing's going to change it, nothing could ever ruffle his feathers. That is simply not the case. Even though he did not change his, he did not uh, give up on his mission, he still struggled. Verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. So here you see Jesus wrestling inside. Well, we all know what it's like to wrestle inside, right? Let's say that you, you know something is right, but it's going to be very painful to do it. And you're thinking, is there maybe some sort of middle ground here where I can avoid the pain and still do something that's kind of right, maybe not as right as this, but I'll still be okay, right? I think many of us know that struggle where we're trying to weigh our options and figure out what are we going to do. We hesitate. We hesitate when we know that there's something we need to do, but that pain is just so going to be so unbearable, causes us to flinch. And here we see, in a sense, we see Jesus flinching emotionally. Now we know that he was always going to obey his father's will. <laughs> there was never a time when he thought, I will not do this. But there was a time when he thought, is there maybe another way? And here we have Jesus struggling with this. 
So right after Jesus proclaims these powerful words in verses 24 through 26, the previous passage about what it means to be a Christian, about what it means to be a disciple, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So right after Jesus says these powerful words, he becomes extremely personal and transparent in what he says next about how he is struggling with this intense emotional battle. Jesus knows. Jesus knows about what it is to struggle emotionally. He is right there with us when we have those struggles. How does this continue? Jesus here, he, he says, but for this purpose I've come to this hour. He knows that he will accomplish the Father's will, even though it's going to be difficult. Verse 28, where is his focus next? Father, glorify your name. That was his focus. Now, I think it's very easy for us to draw a line from this passage directly to our lives, right? We all know what the Father's will is for us. Now, we might not know all the specifics here and there, but generally we know what the Father's will is for us. And when we know that, what should be our response? Father, glorify your name, as Jesus says here. And he continues, or the passage continues, Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it. Again, what's happening here? So despite the temptation of wanting to avoid what's coming, very natural, Jesus ended the struggle with a prayer. What was his prayer? Father, glorify your name. And was it just crickets after that? Did Jesus just kind of get back on the path and travel to his next stop? No, we see here next that the Father responds to Jesus. We see here that Jesus' commitment to the Father's will came with a, a priceless reward. I mean, can you put any value on hearing God's powerful, booming voice crash through the atmosphere in response to something you just said? That's what happens here. So this amazing privilege of hearing his Father's voice publicly, not just in his mind, not just in his heart, not through a dream, not through a vision, but through that atmosphere, at that point in history, the Father spoke through the clouds, as it were, and everyone who was there heard the Father's voice as well. And here we see the Father responding, honoring Jesus' resolve, his willingness to follow through, and showing all there that Jesus was the Son of God. So just this powerful picture here. I mean, it would be, you know, as I read through the Bible, I often think, man, it would be so cool to see, you know, a movie of this scene. Now, this would be pretty amazing as well. And you just think of, you know, a, a really strong thunderstorm. And, you know, you see the flash of lightning, and right after that, you hear the, the boom of thunder. And I'm wondering if maybe that is even kind of weak compared to what Jesus and these people heard at this moment. So we see here that um, God responds to his Father in saying, I, will glorify, <clears throat> I have glorified my name, and I will glorify it again. So the Father will glorify himself. But in doing this, the Father also glorifies the Son. The Son is worthy to have the Father speak directly to him and acknowledge that the Son is right. We see here next, in verse 29, that the crowds also heard the voice, but they didn't have the ability, they didn't have the capacity to understand the words. If you look with me in verse 29, the crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. So here we have some confusion. Of course, the crowd, many of whom were unbelievers. Of course, we have the disciples who were there. We know the disciples were often clueless um, and um, often did not understand what Jesus was saying, did not understand the importance of what was happening in the moment. And so they weren't quite sure what was going on, but many recognized that this was a supernatural event. 
Jesus had just spoken, the heavens had just thundered, and wow, that, that, is, that has got to be connected, I think is what's going on in a lot of people's minds. They recognize, at least many recognize, that this was a unique event. This does not happen all the time. In fact, it never happens. And some understood that Jesus had heard a powerful word from heaven. Maybe it was an angel. They weren't sure. But, but even though they were having a hard time understanding what was going on, they had to recognize that there was something very special about Jesus and his relationship to God. And so, again, verse 29, the crowd that stood there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And now, now we have Jesus answering in verse 30. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. So Jesus is saying, you know, obviously this, vo this voice would have helped Jesus standing in front, uh, with the crowd. But Jesus here is saying, no, actually this voice is for you. You need to understand that I am who I say I am, that I am the Son of God, that I am the Messiah, that I am the one who is proclaiming the truth to you. And so this powerful voice from heaven was an acknowledgement for those people that they needed to believe in Jesus. Because the Father glorified the Son in His death and glorified the Son here through this voice, we must believe in Jesus. So, of course, though Jesus would have appreciated hearing his father's voice, he knew that this voice was mainly for the crowds. God wanted crowds to witness that Jesus was his son, was on his appointed messianic mission to provide salvation to the whole world. We must believe in him. From what I've seen, parents usually love it when their kids do really well at something. Um... Of course, I've talked to many parents over the years, and one particular lady that I used to work with, it seems like almost every day she would say something about how wonderful her, her kids were, how proud she was of her kids. And I respect that. At times it got a little bit old, <laughs> but I definitely respect that. And I think, you know, whether it's a mother, whether it's a father, if they see their children excelling in something, they just, they just can't help but tell people about it, and they're especially proud of that especially when it's something very difficult. So while the parent is happy for the child, the parent may also be thinking, you know, if my kid does well at something, that actually reflects well on me. The, parent, the child's success reflects back on the parent. And so, for example, a child who goes into the Marines or a child who becomes a surgeon or who runs her own company or many other things, many other things, makes the parent proud and reflects well on the parent. So on this Father's Day, there are many fathers who can reflect and be thankful for the success of their children, and no more so than our Heavenly Father. Now, of course, he, the, our Heavenly Father, I'm sure, is very thankful and, and proud when we follow Him. But nothing can match the pride and the joy of the Father to His special Son, Jesus Christ. So if we take the idea of fathers and, and, and mothers being excited and happy and proud of their children when they do something amazing, now magnify that pride and joy times infinity. And now you have an idea of how proud God the Father is of his Son. So here we just see a snapshot of the Father's pride in Jesus in this passage. But we know it has to be, it has to be immeasurable. We can never get a... a, a uh, realistic enough idea of how proud the Father is of the Son. Now that we have caught a glimpse, though, of how the Father honors His Son, let's take that image just for a moment and compare that to how much you and I value the Son. Again, think of how much the Father loves and values His Son. How much do we love and value His Son as well? What in our day-to-day -day lives show that we greatly value and love Jesus Christ? What can we point to and say, yesterday I did this, and that pointed to how much I value the Son? What do we do in the morning of our normal day that values Jesus? What, do, what about the afternoon? How about the evening? How about week to week? How about month to month? What do we do that truly shows that we value Jesus Christ? 
Now, of course, we're all here at church in the morning. Uh, it's almost as if I'm preaching to the choir, right? But if we're honest, if you're like me at all, you get yourself into a nice routine and you almost don't even think about it, right? Why are, why are we here at church this morning? How is it that you made your way here today? Was it because, well, that's just what people expect me to do. It's just what I do on Sunday. You know, it's just like that's an important part of my week. Those are all, you know, obviously valid uh, reasons, but those aren't obviously the best reason. We should be coming here because we value our Savior, because He has done so much for us, because He is our Savior, because He is our life, that we are nothing without Him. So the time and the quality of time that we spend with God reflects on our love for Christ as does the way that we carry out the rest of our lives, how we work at our normal jobs, how we interact with other people. This all reflects as well on whether we value Jesus and how much we value him. So if the father was eager to glorify his son because of the work that he was about to do, how much more should we be eager to glorify the son because of what he has done for us? And after all, we are the ones who've received the gift of salvation. Now, of course, the Father is glorified through the Son. We just read about this here in this passage. But the Father needed no salvation. The Father is God. He he is the one who defines what salvation is and who needs it. He, He did not receive any special gifts. He is the gift giver. We are the ones who receive the gifts. How much more should we love and appreciate the Son because we are on the receiving end of such a wonderful gift that never ends. Because the Father glorified the Son in His death, we must believe in Him. Next we see here in verses 31 through 33, and PowerPoint Byron is not catching up if you're able to look at that. Next we see here that because the Son provides either salvation or judgment, salvation or judgment, we must believe in Him. So, why did Jesus come to earth? We know there's a passage in Scripture which says, I came not to judge the world, but to provide salvation, to provide eternal life. And while that is absolutely true, one of the very uh, key aspects of salvation is the flip side. Why even need salvation unless there is judgment coming? So if you will look with me here, verses 31 through 33. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Because the Son provides one of two options, either judgment or salvation, we must believe in him. So, while Jesus came primarily to bring salvation, again, it cannot come without judgment. We see that verse 31. So, of course, the, the Father is going to judge. We know the Son primarily, to came, came, primarily came to bring, excuse me, primarily came to bring salvation. But, there is still a choice. In a very real way, salvation must also come through judgment. There's a book that I've read a lot of uh, a few years ago called God's Glory in Salvation Through Judgment. So if you read through the whole Bible, that's often what you see no matter where you're looking. God's glory in salvation through judgment. If there is no salvation, there is judgment. If there is no judgment, then there's salvation. So it's two sides almost of the same coin. So think of someone, for example, uh, who was abused. Think of someone who was a victim of some other criminal activity. That person cannot fully feel, and fully is maybe not the best word, but cannot feel that that release from that crime or that, that salvation from that injustice until there is justice until that criminal is brought to justice. And Jesus' coming work was to bring justice to all. To those who believe in him, they receive justice. To those who reject him, they also receive justice. So after mentioning judgment, Jesus then speaks on the salvation that he will provide. Again, look with me 
at verse 32. He says, And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So as dreadful as his death on the cross was, it was also a symbol of something beyond his death, and that was the exaltation as the Son of God. And that, again, is, is a key theme in the book of John. While we have, obviously, the pain and the suffering of Jesus, John is always looking beyond that to Jesus' exaltation, to his glorification, and we see that very clearly in this passage as well. Now, as you read this verse, you might have a question. If you are into studying the Bible and studying what we call theology and about who, you know, who did the Father actually, uh, uh, who did the Father send the Son to save? Whose death, uh, the fa- excuse me, the Son's death, exactly who did that provide salvation for? Then you might have some questions about this verse. Again, it says, uh, I will draw all people to myself. So what does he mean by all people? Does he mean that everyone, no matter who they are, including Adolf Hitler, ends up being saved? Of course not. We know that that's not the case because the Bible is very clear that you have a choice. You either accept Jesus, you repent from your sins, you believe in Jesus to receive salvation, or you reject Jesus and you do not receive salvation. So we know that that can't be the case. Now, there is another interpretation where people might say, well, what, what is happening here is that Jesus is saying, I am coming to offer salvation to the whole world. Now, I believe that's a very biblical, biblical interpretation of other passages, but maybe not this one. I believe what Jesus is saying here when he says, I will draw all people to myself, This comes right after a group of non-Jews comes to see him. So I believe what Jesus is saying is, yes, I'm coming to bring salvation to the Jews, but I'm also coming to bring salvation to the Gentiles. And whenever he says, to draw all people to myself, I mean, I believe he means in this situation to, to, to draw all groups of people without discrimination to myself. The salvation, the special um, privileges of, of understanding God, of having the word of God, that was originally given to the Jews. And any Gentile who was able to make his way or her way over to uh, the, the kingdom of Israel to hear the good news, they could then be saved. But it wasn't offered very widely at all to non-Jews. But now it's going to be. That is what Jesus is saying here. He wants to draw all people to himself. And then we see here in verse 33 <clears throat> that John adds this comment about what, about what it means that he is being lifted up. It says, and he said this to show but what kind of death he was going to die. And that again points back to Jesus' phrase of, when I am lifted up from the earth. That phrase, lifting up, says something about the kind of death he would die. Now, based on how the crowd responds here in the next few verses, which we'll look at, in sh- look at shortly, it could be that lifting up was just a common way that, that in that day they spoke about crucifixion. You know, there is a, uh, a, a word in the Greek language for crucify, but it could be back in that time as well, you know, just like we all have um, different ways to talk about different ideas, they might have, instead of just saying crucified, say, oh, that person was lifted up yesterday. And that could be what was going on in their minds because it seems like they were able to connect what Jesus meant directly to the way that he would die. And again, the Romans uh, were there. They were ruling. This is a common Roman way of crucifixion. These people in Jerusalem probably saw crucifixions all the time, perhaps in the very same spot where Jesus was crucified. And so this is very familiar to them. Horrible way to die. You know, we are so sanitized in our culture here because if someone actually makes it on death row, then they have to wait a while to actually be served the death penalty. And that happens, of course, in a very sterilized environment. You're not going to be walking down the sidewalk and see someone being executed for their crimes. That's what happened, though, back in this day. 
And so we see here that Jesus reveals the type of death that he was going to die. Because the Son provides either judgment or salvation, we must believe in him. Because you definitely do not want judgment. If you want salvation, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Now I want you to think for a moment with me about a normal trip to the grocery store. You go in, what do you do? You maybe get a buggy, you know, you're going through the aisles, you're finding your different things that you need to get, fill it up or your basket if it's going to be a shorter trip. And once you find everything, then comes the real struggle. You say, what, paying for it? Well, that could be a struggle. But the real struggle, at least in my mind, is choosing which line to get in. So, you know, you've got maybe a few lines open at the store. You think, oh man, this one looks the fastest. Let me get in that one. In my experience, it's either a really quick line or you end up getting in the slowest line ever. All right? I'm sure there's some here who have experienced that as well. It's as if there's no middle option. You actually get, you know, you get behind someone who just can't find their credit card in their wallet and you, you're waiting there just five minutes for them to, or if it's, you know, maybe someone a little bit older that writes checks for everything. Oh, they got to write out their check. Oh, then they have to put it in their register. And then you're just, you know, standing there. I cannot believe this. That line had five more people in it, and they're already all the way through, and I'm stuck behind the same person, even though she was the only one in the line. And that can be a very real frustration. And just like it feels like there's often no middle option, it's either super quick or super long, when it comes to Jesus Christ, there are as well only two options. You can either accept Christ and live a life of following him, or you can reject Christ and face his judgment day after day in this life now through your sin and through uh, your suffering because you have not accepted him all the way through eternity. Now, which of those two sound most attractive? Everyone would say, well, I mean, I don't want that. You know, I want, I want an eternal life. But why do so few people actually accept it? Because our sin, our lifestyle, what we like doing day after day, we just do not want to give that up. And we cannot fathom how dangerous it actually is. But that is the choice that Jesus offers. You can have salvation by giving your life to me. You can have judgment for eternity by just doing what you're doing. And not repenting, not believing. Now, some here, I would say up to this point, have um, made, we've, we've all here in this room have made a choice up to this point, right? Many in this room have made a choice to accept Jesus. But there may be some in this room where every day of your life you have made a choice to reject Jesus. But Jesus is still reaching out to you. If you are here in this room, you are hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation. You can make today the last day that you have chosen to reject Jesus, and you can choose to accept him today. So even though you might not think so, your stubbornness to believe the whole gospel means that you are on your path to eternal judgment if you have not yet accepted Jesus. And, so, and you might even realize, yeah, I'm a stubborn person. You realize that you're halfway there. You know you, you have a problem. Why not let Jesus take care of it for you? Now, of course, again, I believe that most who are here in this room have accepted Jesus. You've realized God's claim on your life. You've accepted the fact that you are a sinner, which is absolutely key to accept Christ. And you have given your life to Christ. But there may be some here who have not done that. And let me encourage you to not wait any longer. But if you have accepted Christ, praise God that his drawing work that we just read about, drawing all people to himself, that drawing work has included you. So because the Son provides either judgment or salvation, we must believe in him. And the last point that we see from this passage is because the Son is offering us eternal life now, we must believe in him. Because the Son is offering us eternal life now we must believe in him. If you look with me now, verses 34 through 36. 
So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to him, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying time is limited. Because the Son is offering us eternal life now, we must believe in him. So the crowd understands that Jesus is talking about his execution. Right? So verse 34, again, the crowd answered him, we've heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? And again, they understand lifting up, that means death, that means crucifixion. And so they understand that, but they don't understand that Jesus is talking about himself when he is talking about the one who will be lifted up, the Son of Man, the Messiah. Jesus has done how many miracles? How much amazing teaching? But yet people still, so I don't get it. I don't, what's going on? And honestly, you know, we want to really pick on them, but how often do we not get it either? Now, Jesus does not respond with, I would say, complete clarity and directness in this passage. And he always has a reason for it. But he tells them that the Messiah is there now, and it's up to them to connect the dots. So um, you see here in verse 35, Jesus' response. So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. What is Jesus saying? He's saying the gospel truth is available to you now. One day, you will not have another chance. The darkness is coming when you will not have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ, to accept the truth, to accept the Messiah. So he's saying, I am the light. Um, I believe most directly. And then he continues, the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. So he's saying, you know what? The light's here. If you don't accept it now, you will be in the darkness. Do you really want that? Because when you're in the darkness, you have no idea where you are. You have no idea where you're going. You could be crossing a busy, a busy uh, highway without even knowing it, and you get hit by three cars all at once. Is that really what you want? Is that the way you want to live your life? In darkness? So Jesus is is telling them, now is the time. Believe the truth of the gospel. The one who walks in darkness does does not know where he is going. And then he says in verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light. I believe Jesus is saying here, while you have the opportunity to hear the truth, accept it. Because if you do, then you will become what you really want to be. You will become what you think you are right now, but you're not. That is a son of light, someone who is a son of God, someone who is accepted by God, someone who is a true child of God, even though you are a Jew, Jesus may have been implying. That doesn't mean you are a son of God. Not all Israel are true Israel. And so we see here that Jesus is challenging them to act on the truth now before it is too late. Because the son is offering us eternal life now, we must believe in him. Some of you may have thought about, maybe some of you actually do invest here and there in the stock market. I've been wanting to do that for years, still haven't gotten around to it. And I semi-recently started doing a little bit more research here and there to figure out how I would want to go about investing a little bit of money in the stock market. Now, when you start studying the market, you're watching YouTube videos, you might be reading articles, you eventually hear the same message over and over and over again. What is that message? Start investing now. Start investing now. Doesn't matter who you talk to. If they are in the stock market, you know, if they have their own, you know, uh, YouTube channel about it, you're eventually going to start hearing, now is the time. Because, and and why do they say that? Because then, then they'll start drawing up all these charts and graphs about the last 20 years and say, if you had invested in Microsoft 20 years ago, 
this is how much money you would have right now. If you had invested in Apple five years ago, look at all this money that you would have right now. And, they, and it's a very compelling argument, right? Because look, you need, to, you need to start now because look at all you have missed out on already. And it's implied if you don't start now, think of all you will miss out on in the future. Now, as we look at this passage today, we see a very similar call to believe in Jesus. And by the way, I in no way am saying you need to start investing in the stock market today. That is not at all what I'm saying. You can end up losing a lot of money in that. But the message that you often hear is still the same. Now is the time. Jesus is saying, now is the time. You have a chance now, but that chance will not be here forever. If you delay, you may completely lose your opportunity to believe the gospel. Do you really want to lose that opportunity? Do you want to try it for another day, another hour, and say, oh, I think I'll hold off a little bit, big decision, I've got a lot going on right now, a lot of plans I don't want to mess up, I think I'll hold off on that. When things start to get worse, then I'll consider it. So while this is directed to people who have never believed Jesus, I believe though it's also directed for those of us who have believed him. You might ask, how is that? Because even though our salvation, those of us in this room, those of us who might be watching this online, while our salvation is eternal, the quality of our faith from day to day can change. I think you know what I'm talking about. While you don't lose your relationship with God, you know that relationship becomes strained. You know your faith is weaker at some sometimes and stronger at others. And when we go through a day filled with doubt and fear, or a day filled with anger or bitterness, what are we doing? We are living the life of an unbeliever, essentially. A life of darkness and hopelessness, even though we have at our fingertips the promises of grace that are ours in Christ Jesus. We are grieving the Holy Spirit within us when we decide to fill our day with those types of thoughts and emotions. So yes, in that way, we are living the life of an unbeliever, a life of darkness, a life of hopelessness, instead of putting on the armor of God, the gospel, and going forward in faith. For us believers, Jesus offers the experience of eternal life every second of every day, even though we often decide to choose to experience practically the life of death in those moments when we decide to go away opposite to God's will for us. So while life provides loads of distractions, distractions, right? Uh, is just, just think of your phone for one thing. Lots of distractions to the faith. We are, God calls us to continually renew our mind by the power of the Spirit. We have to recognize, first of all, when we are distracted. We have to recognize when we are investing too much of our life in something that really does not matter. And God calls us to train our minds, which is also called renewing our minds in the scriptures, so that we can enjoy the benefits of eternal life, even through the most difficult of days. Some here in this room, we've had very difficult days recently. Very difficult. Even this morning might have been very difficult for you. And in those difficult days, what, what, what's our temptation? Focus on the difficulty. And become consumed with the difficulty. And have a bad attitude about the difficulty. God here is saying, we don't have to do that. There's another option. There's a better option. Sure, it will still be difficult, but we can go through that difficulty filled with the Spirit by His power instead of being consumed with the negativity and lack of faith because of that struggle. Because the Son is offering us eternal life now, we must believe in Him. And as we look towards the, the end here of this passage, uh, to, uh, the end of this message, to mention what, what do I believe is the main idea of this passage, I believe it's simply this. Because the Father and the Son have clearly revealed the truth of salvation, we must believe in Jesus. This again is Father's Day. I'm very thankful for my Father. I trust that you in this room are very thankful for your fathers, even though we all have different fathers, we have different relationships with our fathers. Some of us might be more thankful for our fathers than others.
But as thankful as we are for our earthly fathers, this is a wonderful passage for Father's Day because this should point us to how thankful we should be for a heavenly father. Our father sent his son so that we could have life. How amazing is that? And not only did he send his son, he then allows us to become his sons so we have a new father in him. Because the Father and the Son have clearly revealed the truth of salvation, it's very clear. There is no excuse for anyone to reject the gospel. It's here. We must believe in Jesus. So this is an amazing truth for us. Those of us who have accepted Christ, this is amazing. For some of us, it may be hard to realize how amazing it is because the darkness of the world without Christ is, is very unfamiliar to us. If you've accepted Christ years and years and years ago, you don't maybe remember how lost you were. But the fact that we have the truth clearly revealed, this is a wonderful gift in itself. Praise God for the, the clarity of the gospel, let alone the experience of receiving the truth, of having that, that we can, that we can uh, rest in day after day. And you can appreciate this even more, I think, when you read some of the truth of other religions. When you read those uh, other, other uh, holy books, you very quickly realize that there is a massive difference between the Bible and those other writings. You read these other writings like, what in the world is this? Not only does this not give me any hope, I can't even understand what this is saying. When we come to the Bible, we see, yeah, there are some tough passages, I'm not going to deny that. But we still, in the midst of some of those challenging passages, we have the gospel clearly revealed to us. And then we have the Spirit within to help us understand the Word of God as well. We have the very Word of God, and He gave it to us very clearly as well. So since the truth of the gospel is so familiar to us, we can be easily tempted to minimize what we've been given as well. Right? Familiarity breeds contempt. We can minimize what the Father and the Son have done for us, and we can respond in sin instead of responding in faith, trusting Christ alone to help us. So we all know the struggle. The question is, what will we do in the future as we continue to struggle? We know what it's like to battle through an offense at home or at work, right? Someone at home just really got on your nerves. Someone at work just really did something that just set you off, and you're really trying to keep it together. We know the truth, but we're having the hardest time allowing the truth to defeat the lie that we are confronted with. But thanks be to God. Remember, thanks be to God. We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory is ours. He's given us everything. Let's respond in faith. Let's believe in Jesus.